Hey everyone, welcome. Sorry, we're, uh, we've had a last minute tech issue and a change of staffing, but um, welcome to the NPA 2-3 uh, meeting for July. Thank you for coming out on a beautiful July evening. Um, I'm Molly. I am a uh, Ward 3 steering committee member for, uh, for this meeting. Um, so let's get this meeting started, huh? We're going to try to stay on time today. We'll see how I do. Um, so we are joined here by a number of other steering committee members. I'll um, have them introduce themselves. We have Roxanne. You want to just uh, say what ward you're part of and your last name because I don't know. I'm sure. Um, yeah, I'm Roxanne Muse. I live in Ward 3 and I just joined the steering committee and I'm going to try really hard to <laughs> be a good timekeeper tonight. <laughs> Great, thanks so much for volunteering, Roxanne, that's awesome. Um, behind the camera, we have Charlie Giannone. He is in Ward 3. I guess I won't make him interrupt his important job. Um, and then in the kitchen, we have Jess Hyman. She's also Ward 3. She's amazing. She's taking on cooking and steering committee. She's incredible. Um, uh, we have a number of other steering committee members, but they aren't able to join us here in person tonight. Um, we are in pretty desperate need of Ward 2 steering committee members. If anyone has interest or has a friend they want to bug, um, we could really use some more Ward 2 um, residents on our committee. Um, so please speak to any of us if you're potentially interested. We could tell you all about it. Um, we aren't going to have an August meeting. We're going to take the month off, enjoy the summer, and we'll be back in September on September 8th um, with another amazing community dinner. So please join us then. Um, if you have any ideas for agenda items, we're always interested, and they can be, you can just email us directly, or you can submit them via the CEDO website. Um, recordings of all of our meetings can be found on YouTube and CCTV's website. Um, we're very interested in hearing feedback on these meetings, how they can be better, and we have an active survey that where we're asking for responses. Um, so there's a very long, complicated URL on your agenda. Um, if you go to the city's website or our website, um, that link will also be there. Um, and just a reminder, when you're speaking, please identify yourself by your name and your ward, and um, please speak into the microphone um, so that we can hear you and the people on the TV can hear you. Um, we do have a Zoom audience, but we had a last minute change in our Zoom link, so uh, they'll probably be late in joining us. Um, so Sam, please let us know when we have people on Zoom. Um, so with that, I'd like to open it up for public forum. If anyone has any, um, anything they want to share with the group, um, please come up to the mic and share it, um, and please keep it to two minutes so that uh, we have time for everybody. I am here on behalf of the Ramble. Maybe we can make announcement type things in the middle after we get joined by more Zoom folks, if, if possible. But I just want to let folks know the event signups. First of all, it's happening Saturday, July 30th. Um, lots of big plans. Field Days is going to happen. Decatur Fest is going to happen. Uh, the One World Market, the Roundup. It's going to be fun. Thank you in advance. Um, and uh, people who are interested in hosting event, events, they, we have two forms on the website. And the website is www.theramble.org. So that's an easy one to find. And on there are different forms. If you are sure you're having an event, please fill out the form. Let us know. We want to put you on the map. Or when I say the map, I think it's going to be mostly a QR code that brings you to the website for a Google map that Roxanne started like, what, seven years ago or something? OK, it seems like a long time. And the, if anybody has an idea and they're not sure if they can, or if they need help, or they want to do something, but they don't have a place, or they have a place, but they're not really into coming up with like an elaborate plan, we have this other form. We're calling it the TBD, the To Be Determined. We're trying to match folks up, find different resources. And then, of course, there's a form to volunteer. And of course, there's a form to sponsor or make any kind of donations. Anything is appreciated. Thank you. 
especially if you're good at manning bouncy houses <laughs> and children that bounce in the bouncy houses. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks for your awesome work organizing. Very cool. <laughs> nice. Thanks so much. Um, I don't think we'll have time for another round of announcements, so if anyone has anything else to share, please do it now. Yeah? Okay, so I'm Charlie G, Ward 3 in uh, Steering Committee, and I just wanted to let people know that right now we're using a really small television monitor. Um, it's, it looks like it's 48 inches or less, and so the, the intention is to get a much larger one, like a 76-inch one, so that people in the room, it's easier for people in the room of, of this size to be able to see it. So I'm just letting people know that we're probably going to be spending, or I'm going to propose that we spend some of our money allocated from the city to buy a much larger television mo monitor. Um, we might be able to get it donated. It might cost a couple hundred dollars. It might cost $500. But I think it, for the benefit of the Old North End Community Center, we need to get a bigger, a bigger monitor. Because right now, what they're doing is they're carrying it from the third floor down to here every time it needs to be used in this room. And it would be better just to have one in the room that just stays over in the corner and doesn't get moved around a lot. So I'm just letting people know we're going to be making, hopefully making a purchase um, in the near future for a bigger monitor. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Charlie. Anyone else for public forum? Yeah, we're aware of that, Barbara. Sorry for the tech uh, glitch. Glad you were able to join us. OK, anyone on Zoom with, with Public Forum? OK, great. Sam, do we have Tony with us on Zoom? OK, great. Um, well, with that, I think we're going to change up the agenda a little bit. We don't have the first presenter with us because he was going to present via Zoom and we had a last minute Zoom change. Um, so let's uh, rearrange our agenda if we're able. Um, do we have Ted Kennedy here? Oh, sorry. No, we don't. Okay. Um, do we have Aaron Ar Ar Ardio? Did you say Ryan Ardio? Yeah. Yes, we do. Awesome. Hi, Ryan. And do we have Kate Logan? OK, awesome. Would you three be willing to have your forum first um, so that then hopefully we can get back on track with people showing up for their agenda items? OK, awesome. Thank you. Um, so. Yeah. Great, thanks. <laughs> okay, great. Well, if you three could move up here, I'll move aside. Charlie, is this right? Like, So the only, the only problem with starting with them early is that they're not going to appear on the archives of CCTV, or will they? Let's see, who's going to miss them? <laughs> no, I guess it's OK. I guess I'm overthinking it. I'm sorry. Okay. Great. Oh, okay. Great. Thanks for thinking it through. OK. Please stand by while we get everyone organized. Okay. Do we have any questions? So there's the only two You 
didn't get the question. No. <laughs> yes. For doing that for us. CCT. I guess that's fair. Yeah. They're, and they're probably fairly like standard. Oh, do you want to do something else? Well, we have Tony now, so we could oh, do okay. Tony's agenda do you item. But you're welcome to. Just oh, down. yeah. No, happy yeah. to wait. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Tony. Of course. Okay, everyone, we have Tony was able to join us on Zoom, so we can actually go back to the original agenda and do his um, presentation on North Street Safety Plan proposal. Um, so thank you for bearing with us. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Sorry, Tony was able to join us. He's going to... Do his presentation. Sorry. I was like, I missed it. All right. <laughs> so, um, so Tony, welcome. I'm glad you were able to join us. We have um, 15 minutes total for this presentation. So, um, how many of those would you like to have for your presentation? How many for questions? And I think you're on mute, Tony. Still on mute. Okay, um, I'll, I'll do ten minutes and then give five minutes for comments. Um, okay, great. This has been a challenge um, <laughs> tonight. Uh, nothing like new Zoom, and uh, it seems to be either, either changing to Zoom or actually changing to another uh, uh, another software. So uh, this seems sort of normal right now. Uh, the, the idea of a North Street safety plan study uh, actually arises out of the, what we've learned over the last couple of years, um, both in, in the city as well as the state and at the federal level that we're way behind on um, safety. And more, and more importantly, importantly, it's the it's poor the areas, areas, it's the areas with, with, with uh, uh, minority, minority uh, populations, populations that, that are, are have, have almost, almost by default, default become uh, uh, a center of transfer racism and low-income uh, uh, injustice. injustice. Uh, our, uh, our historic, historic uh, uh, Old Hope and Main Street, which is North Street, Street uh, uh, it is to be tested with five of the six West End, end uh, uh, high crash intersections uh, um, uh, that cost us about uh, uh, 4 4.3 million, million, million a year. Each high crash intersection has at least at least half an inch of here. here. Um, uh, this is this one of those intersections. intersections. Um, and I remember uh, sitting there at uh, uh, Nunyan's uh, uh, watching, uh, uh, in the only one of the coffee, watching, watching parents, parents uh, uh, hus uh, hustling their kids to school. And I, I sort of didn't think too much about that until more recently when I realized that the reason they're doing it is that there's no safe route, there's no safe route to school on North Street. All the intersections are dangerous. And a few months ago, uh, uh, before school closed, I watched a, a, a just a frantic uh, uh, dance by the uh, by the retired uh, guard that was was uh, going out in the traffic and helping kids get across the street. This this is no longer acceptable. Uh, we know uh, very cheaply how to uh, basically remediate uh, uh, these intersections with uh, uh, with roundabouts uh, that cut uh, basically uh, injuries by 70 percent and serious ones 90 percent, and it's cheap. The public works can do this with jump change. Our public works department has 20 intersections on mostly 25 mile hour streets like this. They haven't addressed a single one of the unsafe intersections in the last uh, decade. And there's everybody I've talked with uh, who lives in, along the street uh, or knows folks who do uh, are well aware of both the, uh, the, the uh, crashes, the injuries, and uh, the dangers that uh, occur at these, these intersections. Um, and I think Payne Jacob said it right when she said, uh, to understand cities, you have to get out and walk. Now this is the this is the uh, uh, North Street. Uh, here is North Avenue, um, and the high crash intersections are uh, Park, uh, as you would expect, North Champlain. Um, 
Uh, this is uh, the it is obviously North Winooski, uh, and also over to catch on uh, North Union Street is also a high crash intersection. The only intersection that isn't high crash is the uh, at least on the state list is is the one everybody talks about, and that's the Elmwood uh, complex there. In part, I think that that may be because that that's not on the state system. They may not have even examined that for for safety. Um, the Burlington transportation situation, uh, we have uh, basically 150 injuries a year, uh, one, uh, basically a three a week. Uh, one of those injuries is either a pedestrian or a bicycle, and the other two are car occupants. Uh, nationally, um, we have 21,000 excess dead uh, each year. We used to be number one in safety, now we're 18, uh, and another 80,000 serious injuries. Uh, the increase in ped deaths, since 2010, um, of 50 percent, two of those deaths occurred here in Burlington. The point is that it's got to be safety first, and we need to do a safety study of this street. Um, two actions are needed, actually, at the state level. And we, I'm sure we have some legislators here. We began to talk about this a little bit. Uh, we need to enable cities and towns to set street speed limits down to 20 miles an hour. 25 is too high for, for the uh, busy streets like North Street. Uh, and and uh, until we are allowed to, to lower our speed limits, and then secondly, uh, enable automated uh, fixed and mobile ticketing systems uh, so we can enforce those speed limits, we will, that, that is a part and parcel of a, of a second major piece in reduction of, uh, of crashes and injuries. Uh, first is getting the right infrastructure, secondly is getting the right enforcement. Um, our base, uh, again, the base inventory of uh, injuries is about 150 a year. Uh, and you know, you, you've got to talk about people in cars. Everybody's worried about pedestrians and bicycles, bicycles but two people uh, in, in cars are injured every, every week. And so I, I'm sort of, not that I am concerned, I'm as, I'm as concerned about an injury to a person in a car or a bike or, or on, on foot. Um, this is, uh, I won't bother to go into this, this, this entire document will be put online, but basically um, in, in uh, Burlington, we have 20 uh, high crash intersections, uh, almost uh, all but one signalized. Uh, they are mostly in the downtown, uh, Old North End, and uh, uh, King Maple, what a surprise. All told, most of 25 miles speed. So the point is, the problems are in our, our, our uh, densest population areas where we, where we have both uh, the population and we have uh, the traffic that's built up over the years, and we really haven't dealt with, uh, uh, with, with, with addressing safety. Um, the 20 high crash intersections in Burlington average 1.4 injuries a year, 14 per decade. Um, and if we take a look at this roundabout in, in Manchester Center, uh, we have now 52 years of experience that's been recorded uh, for roundabouts. We haven't had, uh, in, we have basically, well, we have 1.4 injuries a year at our at crash intersections here in Burlington. Uh, the five downtown roundabouts in Manchester, Middlebury, and Montpelier average one injury a decade to give you some feel of the impact. There has yet to be, and please don't be the first one, there's yet to be a single person who has ever been, as a pedestrian, ever hit on the 8,000 uh, roundabouts in the United States and Canada and killed on a marked crosswalk. Two pedestrians in Burlington were killed in the last decade uh, or so on, on marked crosswalks. We have a transportation plan, it's a little old, 2011. Uh, it states uh, quite clearly that safety, and I'll quote the uh, plan now, safety is of critical importance, particularly where walkers and bikers interact with cars and trucks. That's exactly what we have on North Street, and we need, we need the, the Public Works Commission to begin to address it. Uh, this is a, the intersection uh, uh, at the famous intersection at Pine and Maple. Um, it, 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 it's now an all-way stop. Um, I'm not going to get into the parkway in this part, but the parkway would put a brand new signal there. Uh, it, it makes no sense. It would decrease the safety for pedestrians and for that, that community. Um, 
So, key elements in the North Street Safety Plan study, which only take a few months, full public engagement with the advisory committee, a uh, possible added study of the east end of the street, there are people concerned about Pomeroy, uh, by crossing at Pomeroy, uh, and also all the way up at the, uh, up at the end of Nancy. Uh, do analytics with the detailed crash and injury impacts, um, and I think that analytics would uh, also look at the, uh, uh, the effect of, uh, of, of, remedi of remediation with uh, uh, with uh, cheap uh, mini roundabouts. This is the only mini roundabout in Vermont. Uh, you notice some cars can actually drive over the Central Island. It's in uh, Manchester Center. Uh, it's done very well. I don't think there's ever been an accident there. Um, in addition to the plan study, you would look at uh, evaluate the shift of mode potential for walk, bike, transit uh, from vehicles. Evaluate delay per person, uh, estimated uh, prevail, prevailing average speeds, uh, effect on, uh, obviously, we've been very concerned about uh, the effect on climate change uh, of any, any investments. And finally, um, many roundabouts cost uh, uh, near traffic calming realm and really cheap. Uh, I say that the public works department could use chump change to do this to, to implement the, the study. We're not talking about millions. We're talking about, you know, maybe two or three hundred thousand dollars. Um, national uh, issues in January, which are recognition the United States has gone from first to 18th, with 21,000 excess dead on our streets. Things actually got worse in 2022. Uh, believe it or not, the highest number of, of, of road deaths in 15 years. Um, and there will be pressure on uh, cities like Burlington that use federal funds and patrons to actually begin to address uh, the high cost and the, and the uh, uh, issues related not only to um, really three parts of the National River, roadside, national highway safety study are one, uh, preventable deaths and injuries, number two, address climate change, and number three, uh, the equity for low income and minority uh, people at the same time. Um, I'll leave it there. Let's see if there's any, Great. Uh, any questions. Perfect, Perfect timing, timing Tony. That was 10, 10 minutes. minutes. Thank, Thank you for your presentation. presentation. Um, yeah. yeah. Is, there Is there any questions, questions or comments in the room, room for, for, for Tony? Tony? Yeah. We have, we have one, one in the room. room. Hey, Tony. It's hey, Lucy. Lucy, Lucy Glock, Glock Ward 3. 3. I, live I live at the bottom of our street on Blodgett. Which is the, the lower, lower end. end. Can, can you hear me, me okay? okay? Yes, I can. Okay. okay. So, so one, one thing we have at Lower North, North <clears throat> between Pickin and Blodgett, as, as you're, you're heading, heading down towards, towards North, North Avenue, Avenue, is some visibility issues, issues around, around the way that the cars, cars are parked and, and trying to get, get from, from those streets out, out onto North, North Street. So the, the, the configuration of the parking and visibility is kind of tricky there, just as a note. And then obviously as a biker, the the, the condition, condition of the of pavement, pavement, you know, you know the, the holes, holes and the grates and, grates and, all, and all that stuff are really, are really dangerous, dangerous and sort of force, force us out into, out into the middle of the street. street. So, so I'm sure, I'm sure you're, thinking you're thinking of those things, things but, but I thought, I thought it would add that, that comment. comment. Absolutely on the mark. And uh, we really have not looked at, uh, there's all kinds of issues like uh, in terms of safety for pedestrians. Uh, you, you don't have a car that's parked within 25 feet of a corner of the street so that you have some visibility, so the pedestrian has some visibility of approaching vehicles and vice versa. Uh, one of the worst locations in my view is on Grant and uh, um, trying to cross Grant from uh, over to the, well, when it, when it used to be there, the, the protected bike lanes there on North Union. Uh, and and you got a car sitting right there at the corner. you got cars, you know, parking right up at the corner and the cars coming up North Union and 25 miles up. There's no question that the city has bent the rules to, to uh, try to squeeze in an extra car, uh, an extra parking place, versus versus uh, responding to the safety needs of the people on the street, uh, and that needs to change. And that, that 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 should be looked at as part of the plan. Great. Any, Any additional, additional questions, questions or, or comments? comments? Charlie, Charlie me up. Me up. Hello, Tony. Hello, Tony. Charlie, Charlie G here. here. Um, so, so I think, I think most, most people, people would agree that, that uh, Burlington, Burlington is maxed out as far as financing new projects is concerned. Is concerned. So, so do you have, have a, a general, general idea of the timeline of the, time of the changes you'd like, you'd like to see or the survey you'd like to see done 
on North Street or where the funding would come from? Do you have an idea of that? Thank you. Well, actually, uh, I've talked about the, the mini roundabouts. Basically, it's some paint and uh, uh, some, some uh, you know, basically round, uh, round uh, uh, traffic calming uh, uh, pies. And, but in terms of the actual study, I don't expect this would cost more than, uh, this should be fundable within, within the city budget uh, without having to go to get a special uh, a grant uh, from the feds. If this is a safety study. The, the Regional Planning Commission is supposed to be dealing, supposed to be decreasing the number of people who are hurt uh, with serious and fatal injuries. VTrans has that obligation. I don't see this as a problem of financing. I, I see it as a problem of recognition and uh, uh, getting the plan done. In terms of actual uh, changes on the ground, uh, those would be, as I said, that's jump change uh, at, uh, uh, at, public, uh, at public works. I mean, we're spending seven million, seven point seven million for construction of the roundabout down there on uh, uh, Shelburne Street, and that should open in a few days. Uh, I wouldn't expect it would cost two or three hundred thousand dollars to do the five or six uh, intersections that uh, are, are targeted here. That gives you some relationship uh, to the, the, the actual costs and and the the payoff in terms of reduced injury and suffering per dollar spent would be you know very high. Great. Great. I think, I we, think have we have time, time for, for one, one more question. question. Does, Does anyone, anyone on, on Zoom, Zoom have a have question? question? Any, any hands, hands raised? raised? Nope. Nope. Doesn't, Doesn't look like we have, we have any, questions any questions on Zoom. Zoom. Anyone, anyone else in the room like to ask, ask a question, question or make a comment? comment? Okay. okay. I think we're I think good we're here. here. Thank, Thank you, Tony, for presenting and for your work. Thank you. Thanks for the time. And I'm glad we finally got on the Zoom. Yeah. Glad you're able to make it. Great. Uh, well, we will move on to starting our forums now. Um, do we have Ted Kenny now? No. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, great. Well, if we could do our House um, House of uh, Representatives forum, then that would be awesome if you are all willing. Um, so we'll let them make their way up here. Um, while they are transitioning, I'll just um, remind everyone that the primary is August 9th, a Tuesday. Um, the state will not be sending out mail-in ballots automatically um, for the primary, so you have to request them if you do want to be able to vote by mail or have an absentee ballot. Um, so there is a very long URL on our, our um, agenda. If you would like to um, request one, you can follow that URL or Google. Um, it, I'm sure will come up. It's also on our website and on CEDO. So uh, be sure to request a mail-in ballot if that's the way you would like to vote. Um, we will have our forum for our house seat now. Um, uh, we are, our house district elects two representatives, so um, two of these fine folks will be representing us in Montpelier. Um, we have with us Jill Kwinski, who is our incumbent running. Um, we have Ryan Adario. Adario, but Adario. that was close enough for me. Nice to meet you. Thank you for running. Um, and we have Kate Logan. Um, all running for the Democratic um, ticket in the primary. So um, the way we're going to structure our forum today is that we're going to have um, get each of you an opportunity to do introductions up to two minutes, and then we're going to have questions for the candidates. Um, candidates will have two minutes to each respond to the question. Um, so please be thinking of questions that you would like to ask these candidates, and you can write them down on your note cards if you want to have me ask them, or you can come up to the mic when the opportunity arises. For people on Zoom, please raise your hand and we'll, um, we'll be sure to call on Zoom uh, participants in, in a rotating order. Um, and then we'll, have a, we'll give 30 minutes to this forum and then um, at five of, give you two minutes to wrap up closing statements. Any questions before we start? Okay, great. Um, well, why don't we start with Kate um, for your introduction. Um, hello, folks. My name is Kate Logan. I use she and they pronouns. Um, and I'm running to represent the Old North End in downtown in the Vermont State House. 
I'm the director of a statewide nonprofit social service network, a community organizer, a public policy analyst, and a leader in movements for social, economic, and climate justice in Vermont. Since 2016, I've lived in the Old North End at the Bright Street Housing Cooperative with my two children, who by next year will have both graduated from Burlington High School. I grew up in a racially, ethnically, and religiously diverse working class community in the Chicago area. I'm the first person in my family to graduate from college and graduate school, and I completed my degrees uh, studying economics, ecology, participatory democracy, and human rights while I was a single parent. And I have the student loans and understanding of the social service system for low-income Vermonters to prove it. Um, since moving to Vermont in 2013, I've been a leader in advocating for working families and helping Vermont elect diverse and progressive local leaders elected to public office. I do this because I believe that communities need their own voices represented in our legislature. We deserve to be governed by people who personally understand the everyday struggles that can be addressed through good public policy. Um, across the political spectrum, uh, most Vermonters want to live in thriving and welcoming communities. Often what has gotten in the way of this is political leaders who are a little bit out of touch with everyday Vermonters. Um, those who are suffering from unjust and inequitable um, policy deserve a voice in the State House for them and the opportunity to be more deeply involved in shaping policies that impact them directly. Uh, by working together across difference in power and centering the needs of those who have been historically marginalized, uh, we will achieve our vision for Burlington and our state. Thanks. Great, thanks so much, Kate. I should have mentioned that Roxanne here is keeping time, so if you thanks. hear her buzzer go off or she starts waving at you, she, uh, it's time to wrap it up. Go off, yay! <laughs> you did perfect. Great, great. Uh, Jill. Thank you. I am Jill Krowinski. I am your current state representative along with Kurt McCormick and Kurt has decided not to run again um, and is just deeply grateful for all your support. Uh, he couldn't be here tonight but I just wanted to share that with you. I am current, I've represented this district for about 10 years and I'm also serving as the current speaker of the Vermont House. Uh, I am running for re-election because I believe that we need an economy that works for everyone and that we need a COVID recovery plan that leaves no one behind. And I have a track record of getting tough things done. I think that we need to continue to focus our work on affordable housing and childcare. We need to continue to push this administration to do more on climate change. And we need to do more on gun violence prevention. And we need to do everything in our power to protect reproductive rights. I spent nearly eight years working at Planned Parenthood of Northern New England, ensuring that we could do everything in Vermont to make birth control, and abortion accessible to everyone, uh, no matter what life situation they were in. And I was part of the movement in 2019 when we saw Trump having Supreme Court nominees to make sure that we did everything to codify Roe in Vermont statute and now move this constitutional amendment, the Reproductive Liberty Amendment, forward. That is going to be on the ballot in November, so I really hope that we can count on your support for that. Uh, I live in the Old North End on Spring Street with my partner Tim and our pup, Murphy Brown. So you may have seen us walking around the neighborhood. Uh, we love our community, that's why we've restored an old house on Spring Street that we're now living in. And uh, I would be honored to have your vote to go back to Montpelier. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, go, please go to my website, jillkrowinski.com. Uh, and also, um, we'll be, stick around after this if anyone else has questions. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jill. Ryan. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, my name is Ryan Adario, and I live in Ward 3. I live on Main Street, right downtown, and I use... Oh. Okay, great. I was an actor, so I tend to eat the mic. Um, I live downtown, I use he, him pronouns, 
And Jill gave me a call in June and asked if I would throw my hat into the ring once Kurt decided that he wasn't going to run again. I'm really um, honored to have both of their support. Kurt is serving as my treasurer. And I've really been enjoying getting out there and talking to neighbors, especially in the Old North End, because I live downtown. Um, my background is in affordable housing. I worked for Champlain Housing Trust for a number of years and also at Steps to End Domestic Violence. For the last three years, I have been doing communications and development for Lyric Theatre Company, which was very exciting during the pandemic to be working in live theatre, but we made it. Um, I am running because I always think about what my mom used to say, which was, no one's asking for it to be easy, but it shouldn't be this hard. I want to help families live the kind of life that I get to live in Burlington. I think through my work, I've been able to interact with folks that don't share the same way of life in Burlington that I have, and I'm so grateful to have. So I'm really committed to affordable housing, not just because it's my background, but because I think that is kind of the key to a lot of our issues. I think it's the key to COVID recovery. I think it's the key to the opioid crisis. We need to invest in reimagining our physical infrastructure and also investing in new permanently affordable housing for all. I think every Vermonter deserves to live with dignity in secure housing. Um, and I also want to just echo what Jill mentioned about the Reproductive Liberty Amendment. I know a lot of people are terrified after the Supreme Court decision. I am too, and I urge you to vote yes in November, no matter what happens in the primary. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for all of your introductions. It's nice to meet you. Um, we'll open it up to audience questions now. So we'll start with a question from the room and then ask Zoom for a question. So does anyone want to shoot their hand up first? Well, we're waiting for people to raise their hands. I, there was a request to um, have another announcement about the ramble. <laughs> so, we'll, so, so the ramble is happening on July 30th. You can go to theramble.org to sign up and get more information. I got you. <laughs> Does it help for us <clears throat> to be on the mic? Is that helpful for other people on the Zoom to hear? Or? Yeah. Hi, all. Thanks for running. Um, so as you know, uh, we are suffering badly in Burlington and Winooski with the F-35s. And I wonder if you see any role at all for the legislature in pushing to, um, to end the, the basing here and have those um, military jets uh, leave the area. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, we'll start with Jill and then go to Ryan and Kate. Thanks, Lucy, for that question. So what I have learned when we first found out that the jets were going to be based here, uh, I reached out to our federal delegation to find out what our role is as a state and how much authority do we have. And what I found out is that we do not have jurisdiction over the F-35s. It's a federal program that's run through the United States Air Force. And so, you know, we can send the federal delegation or send the um, federal administration our concerns and complaints. But year after year, we just don't have authority in the legislature to make change. Now, what we can do and what we have done is invested in weatherization for homes that are impacted by the sound. So it's this great twofer that we're insulating homes better that need to be, um, that need to be insulated, but also that helps with this, the noise. Um, we also had a vote on a resolution at the end of the session, just making a statement um, around concerns around nuclear weapons and just wanting to live in a safe place. But unfortunately, uh, it's not in our jurisdiction. Okay, thanks. Um, so I remember uh, a few years ago, I, I didn't really understand the big to-do about F-35s, and then my office for the last three years has been in South Burlington, and now I'm pretty passionate about it. It shakes the entire building, and it's awful, and I'm only there for a number, you know, short amount of time during the day. Um, I think where the state does have a role is in mitigating the impact for especially lower income families. I think what's clear is there's a disproportionate impact on folks who can't afford to retrofit their homes to deal with the noise, the shaking, and it's also terrifying. I think we, um, my boss and I always like to say when the building is shaking, we're extra safe today. Um, but. That's not the experience of folks who are trying to sleep. I think especially kids, I've uh, heard from many 
people that it's very scary. Um, so I think we need to also make sure that people have the emotional support um, if, if they are struggling in their homes with it, in addition to doing everything we can to help them retrofit their homes. Kate, would you like some time? Um, thanks. Um, yeah, I would echo a lot of what has already been said by um, Jill and Ryan. And um, in addition, I live in the Bright Street Housing Co-op, which is uh, the most recently uh, developed Champlain Housing Trust um, affordable housing cooperative in um, Burlington. Uh, opened in 2016, moved in the first week, and I can tell you that we're in the flight path of the F-35. In my uh, work as a grassroots organizer, I have worked on the F-35 issue and found the exact same thing. It's not within the state house jurisdiction. Lobbying your state legislators about removing the F-35s is not the move. However, um, as both Jill and Ryan have said, we can do things to uh, weatherize and soundproof uh, homes. We know that uh, the folks who can least afford it um, are most impacted because the flight path does happen to be in some of the most low income areas, particularly in Winooski, which is outside of our jurisdiction. Uh, but we can certainly work with our friends like Representative Taylor Small over in Winooski um, to uh, continue to invest deep, like heavily, in weatherization programs that soundproof homes, especially for low-income Vermonters. Great, thank you. Um, does anyone on Zoom have their hand raised to ask a question? Barbara, would you like to go ahead? Yes, I would like to hear how each of you feel about changing Act 250 to make it easier to loosen environmental requirements to make it easier for developers to develop. I understand the need for affordable housing in Burlington and in Vermont in general. And I also wonder about if loosening environmental restrictions is the way to accomplish that. Thanks, Barbara. To clarify, was that Act 250 you were asking about? Okay, great. Act 250. Uh, Ryan, then Kate, then Jill. Uh, I don't have a ton of experience with the environmental side, but what I will tell you is um, from the perspective of folks who are trying to build more affordable housing and invest in uh, making sure that everyone is able to live safely and with dignity here, um, that doesn't have to be in conflict with uh, environmental regulations, even strict ones. Um, I think Vermont has been a leader, especially organizations like Champlain Housing Trust, um, as far as making sure that the way we're building in Vermont is sustainable and also um, that we're accomplishing the goals uh, that we've set forth to get folks housed. So I don't think they need to be in conflict. Um, I'm excited to dive in and learn more about this particular act, but um, I will, I assume Jill will probably know quite a bit about the act itself, um, but, but that's, what I, that's where I stand. Thanks, Ryan. Kate? Yeah, um, great question. I do not know as much about Act 250 as I need to know, and I think I'll probably go home and learn more about it tonight, but I know enough from working in the State House as an advocate to know that um, we, we definitely should not relax environmental regulations in order uh, to uh, build more affordable housing. In fact, one of the things that we know um, and passed the Global Warming Solutions Act to solve was that a large majority of our carbon emissions in the state come from transportation. And so if we need more affordable housing, we should be developing it um, densely um, in, in places like Burlington and other town centers throughout the state, uh, in places who, where, that are close to where people work, um, so that we can reduce um, transportation emissions at the same time that we're building affordable housing. Um, there are many other reasons why we should not uh, relax environmental regulations to encourage development. Uh, which is not to say that I am anti-business. I am very, very much so pro 
uh, building a local vibrant economy. Um, but I do think that we can do that in a way that meets our carbon emissions goals, um, yeah, and without relaxing our, our very high standards for the environment. Thanks, Kate. Jill? Hi, Barbara. Thanks for the question, and it's nice to see you. Uh, so Act 250 is uh, the rules and regulations that we have set up in our state to protect the environment and ensure that we're making strategic decisions around how we develop businesses and housing across our state. And um, over the years, we've been trying to modernize it, and unfortunately, the governor has vetoed almost all of our Act 250 updates. Uh, one thing that we worked on this legislative session in, uh, in working on our affordable housing bill is finding a way that we can make it easier around Act 250 in designated downtown areas that already have robust permitting, permitting and zoning departments set up because the whole point of this is to ensure that we are, we're building in a smart way that we can protect consumers and make sure that they have access um, to what they need. And so we, we did this uh, change in S226, which did pass as part of our larger affordable housing bill and that the governor did um, sign into law. So Barbara, we did do some of what you're mentioning, but we did it in a very narrow way to ensure that we can continue um, to build smartly and um, an environmentally friendly way. And there are other tools in our toolbox as well that we can do to ensure that um, we're building affordable housing in the right place for the right people. And um, that is a lot of the work and investments that we did this legislative session. Great, thank you. Is there a question in the room for the candidates? Yeah, great, go ahead. Hi, thank you for running. Um, my name's Helen Reed and I live in Ward 2 and I serve on the Robin's Nest board which is right out here. <laughs> it's a child care center here in the Old North End. Um, my question is about um, funding for the child care system. So our budget at Robin's Nest is incredibly tight and we've benefited over the last couple of years from COVID relief dollars and we're coming to the end of that money and the buffer that that money has provided to us. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you plan to, if you plan to, stabilize the child care system in Vermont um, and really invest in our youngest Vermonters. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, we'll go Kate, Jill, and Ryan. Yeah, um, thank you so much for bringing up this very important issue. This is one of my passions, actually, is early child education and care. That's what I wrote my dissertation on. Um, and uh, my, my first work in the state of Vermont was as an intern for a number of different um, early childhood education and care organizations, including Vermont Birth to Five. Um, and um, in terms of what I would do personally to stabilize um, child care funding, I will say I, will be one of one, I would be one of 150 legislators, um, and I would certainly work uh, very hard to support the funding for early child education and care. I do think it is, um, long, we're long past due for significant investment in early child education and care. It should be universal. It should be high quality. Um, child care educators should be paid like educators. Um, and um, we will need to raise new sources of public revenue in order to do so. I'm not um, sure, aside from increasing the top brackets of uh, the income tax to um, make our effective tax rate for Vermonters equitable. Right now, lower income Vermonters actually pay a larger percentage of their um, income in taxes across the board. Um, I think that we'll have a tremendous amount of tax revenue coming in from the, the legal sale of um, re uh, recreational cannabis. Um, we, we need to be creative and um, start finding new sources of funding, such as um, a state bank, for example. Um, but that really depends on there being enough votes in the state house to pass it, and a governor who won't veto it, and the ability to um, pass it without uh, pass a veto override. Thanks, Kate. 
Jill? Uh, thanks, Helen, for the question. And I have to say, Robin's Nest is so, uh, it is just imprinted in the fabric of our community and, and all the great work and services they provide. So um, really proud of Robin's Nest and that it's in our community. We're very lucky. Uh, so this uh, ch affordable childcare has been a top priority for me in the legislature my entire time, especially as Speaker of the House. We, uh, a couple years ago, put into place in legislation a multi-year plan to tackle affordability and accessibility and quality um, for health care centers in our state. This past year, uh, we really focused on workforce development. Um, as you know, uh, child care centers across the state really struggled through COVID, and they were already struggling before, and so it, the impact was huge. So we invested millions of dollars for direct support to child care centers, uh, support for um, providers to go to school to attain the next level um, of accreditation that they need, and provided grants for centers to use for recruitment and retention. So we really focused on supporting them in the workforce way. And the way that we um, thought about families was really important to ensure that we are you know, providing support on both sides. So not only the child care centers, but the families. And so I was proud to push forward and achieve into law um, an earned income or a tax, child tax credit uh, that gives families uh, $1,000 per child, five and under. Uh, and that is law now, which I think will be tremendously helpful. We expanded the earned income tax credit for children and also uh, passed a COVID family leave policy. So if you have uh, COVID and you can't be at work, you can be covered for that amount of time, um, up to 40 hours to recover. Uh, moving forward, uh, I'll continue to advocate for funding for child care and paid family leave. Thank you. Great, thank you. <laughs> Ryan? Thank you. Um, so I actually, Jill and I first met when um, I was working at Champlain Housing Trust and we were fundraising here and I worked really closely with the Robin's Nest team um, to fund the capital campaign. and. It is an, such an institution here in Burlington, and there are places like that in every community in Vermont that are really doing the work. And if we don't fund not only the actual organizations, but the people who work there, um, we're setting our kids up to fail. Um, that said, a lot of people don't have access in the first place to this kind of childcare. I also, just want to say that the part that's a real sticking point for me is that because we don't have universal child care, we're leaving about 5,000 people, disproportionately women, out of the workforce. Um, it should be a choice if you stay home with your child. It shouldn't be um, because you have to. <laughs> it shouldn't be because there's no other option. So I, I think Jill and Kate and I are all swimming in the same direction on this. Obviously, we want to fix this. It's vital for our communities, and it's vital for the future of Vermont. I think we lose young people um, in this state all the time, and things like this tell me, as someone who's thinking about starting a family possibly um, in the next few years, is this a good place to raise my family? We need to make sure that that piece is in place in order um, to make this somewhere where people can raise families successfully. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, do we have any questions on Zoom? Anyone who'd like to ask a question, just raise their hand. Ginger, would you like to ask a question? I would. I, I'm always concerned in the housing question, uh, affordable, it often excludes the people at the bottom. And at the end of June, we just saw the people who were housed turned out, and we're seeing the results of that on our streets. I'm at Cathedral Square, and we're seeing a lot in the parks and around us. Uh, and it seems like, I, I know there's an overall problem, but often it's they're talking about people who have higher income. When this squeeze comes on, it hits people at the bottom much harder. I, mean, I love to see people moving here to get jobs and to find, you know, that's all necessary. But we've neglected uh, the people at the bottom for a long time. 
the housing question, I was very involved with Jump for many years and it was always came back to the housing question. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to know, I, I know you tried to pass things, but, but how to include that, how to make sure that that's an all inclusive so it reaches right down to, to very basics here. Thanks, Ginger. Uh, we'll go Jill, Ryan, then Kate. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Ginger. I, you know, as I talk to people across the old North End, housing comes up almost every single time. And um, I myself has, have also struggled um, to make a mortgage or to pay rent. And uh, this year, this was a, a ton, another top priority in the legislature because, again, like so many other issues, the housing crisis was an issue before COVID, and then COVID just made it worse, right? With so many out-of-staters coming into Vermont, which is great, but a lot of the housing, especially in, in the southern part of the state, was uh, bought by out-of-staters, forcing some local people out and having to move out farther. And so I've heard um, and had a lot of conversations with folks uh, in the southern part of the state about that. But going back to what we did this last legislative session, we invested hundreds of millions of dollars um, in different ways. First of all, in first-time homebuyer grants uh, to ensure that everybody has access that are forgivable. We did um, investments in housing specifically to be built for low and middle income Vermonters really had strong, tight guardrails on that language to ensure um, that we weren't um, making it exclusive and that it was accessible to everyone, no matter what their income is, to get them access to housing. And then another issue that we worked on in, in regards to housing is workforce. We have a workforce shortage when it comes to plumbers, electricians. I mean, think about just those who've been trying to get someone to come out to their house to do a renovation, right? Like the wait, the wait list, the wait time is so long. So uh, what we did is we invested uh, into programs for free tuition and critical uh, careers uh, like plumbing, and like electricians and others um, to help build the bench and get more providers out there. So I'm proud of the work that we did to make housing more affordable and I will continue to focus on that work. Thanks. Ryan? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ginger, for asking the question. First of all, I feel you because I live downtown and I can sense the shift since folks um, lost that emergency housing recently. It's palpable um, and it's unacceptable. I think in a state where we have this much uh, wind behind Democrats and progressives, uh, there's no reason why we can't get it done here. You look about um, you know, you look at states where they have decided to solve the housing crisis, um, and if they can get it done there, I think we can certainly get it done here. I have been in the rooms on both sides of the equation representing affordable housing providers and also representing folks where it is the most minuscule amount of money that is the difference between someone being unhoused and housed. But I want to make it really clear that the biggest part of the equation is that it's permanently affordable. Getting someone into a home is not a solution uh, for very long. You need wraparound services to make sure that folks stay housed. It's a huge transition to go from being unhoused. And we also need to make sure that we're investing in all parts of the portfolio. So that is the one good part of uh, the, the news about housing is that investment uh, anywhere across the spectrum will help everywhere. So um, I'm with you. Uh, I think we need to make sure we're getting people housed and that there's ongoing support. And there are a lot of organizations that are doing that work. But I think it's it's an issue that impacts, as I as I stated earlier, it's an issue that impacts every facet of life. Housing is healthcare. Housing is safety. Uh, and it's also going to help edu our education system, making sure that kids can stay in the same district without having a tremendous commute. Um, it's all related, and I think we need to prioritize housing before, uh, honestly, anything else in the state at this point. Thanks. Kate? Um, yeah, thanks so much, Ginger. Great question. Um, I believe that housing is a human right um, and that housing should come first. In my, uh, my day job, I work with uh, youth experiencing homelessness. 
Um, I lived in Portland, Oregon during the time that Dignity Village uh, came into full existence as a cooperatively self-managed and partially publicly funded housing model for those experiencing chronic homelessness. Um, I'd like to see this model implemented in Vermont, um, particularly in Burlington, as it increases independence and dignity for those experiencing homelessness. Um, I'd rely upon expert advocates to more fully develop my position on this, but that um, I'm a strong proponent of that model. Um, further, as a resident of a permanently affordable non-ownership housing cooperative, which is a mouthful, uh, the Bright Street Housing Cooperative, um, developed by Champlain Housing Trust. I would like to see this model aggressively replicated throughout Vermont. Uh, it eliminates the landlord-tenant relationship and still allows utilization of Section 8 vouchers and other sources of public funding for affordable housing. Um, Vermont needs to invest even more in, uh, to guarantee housing affordability in the state. Um, public housing which is more of a federal issue, frankly, is likely a crucial aspect of full, implement, uh, full implementation of a housing guarantee, and so I'd love to work with our federal delegation on building new public housing once again, um, and additionally moving towards more equitable um, state investment um, for housing access across the board would require um, subsidizing mortgage fees and guarantees for members of historically marginalized groups um, so that we can expand also uh, community land trust capacity for shared equity models for single family home ownership. Great, thank you. Um, our time allotted uh, has flown by, so we'll move on to closing statements. Um, so if you, you have up to two minutes to say whatever else is on your mind you'd like us to know, and we'll start with Ryan and then go to Kate and Jill. Sure, Kate, okay, can you actually pass the water? Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> water break. Oh, you Thank just need the picture. Yeah, I think there so. Sorry, I didn't know no. I'd be first. Um, <laughs> okay, now I'm good. Now I'm ready. Um, so as I said before, um, I'm running because I want to ease um, the burden on a lot of our working families here in Vermont. I am so grateful to live here. I'm so glad that a decade ago, my partner said let's move north and we did and I haven't looked back. I really treasure my experiences here working with folks that are on such a fragile edge. I see the businesses in our downtown and I know that if you work there you can't afford to live here and it shouldn't be that way. If we are using your labor in this community you should be able to afford, afford to live here. Um, I feel really strongly too, and I don't want to miss the opportunity to make sure that everyone votes yes in November for the Reproductive Liberty Amendment. Prop 5, vote yes, everyone, we all need to commit to it. I think Vermont is a model for the rest of the country. We've done it before on many other issues, and I think particularly on this one, we need to show that it's possible, that it's popular, um, and show other states how we can get it done. I think that's the best way we're going to help our neighbors around the country is by voting yes on Prop 5. And I really hope that you'll reach out to me, ryanforrep at gmail.com, or go to my website, ryanadario.com. I really want to hear from you. Um, I want to know what you're afraid of. I want to know what you're excited about in our community. And I'm grateful to be your neighbor, and I hope I can count on your vote to represent you in Montpelier next year. Thanks, Ryan. Kate? Great. I'll just keep it really brief. Um, I've said a lot already. I uh, hope that uh, you know that voting is on August 9th um, for the Democratic primary for this race. You can order a ballot and vote early if you don't want to vote in person or can't vote in person. Um, and. Um, you can find those instructions on the internet or by looking on my website. It is kateloganforhouse.com. You, um, uh, there's also a clipboard that will be going around the room that has QR codes and a sign-up sheet. If you would like, uh, if you're interested in the campaign, you can also find all of that information on my website. Again, that's kateloganforhouse. Dot com. Um, you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and a link to my email, which is kateloganforhouse at gmail.com, um, is also on my website. I'd love to um, talk with you, um, answer any questions you may have, and I do hope that you'll plan to vote for me um, on or before August 9th.
Um, and thanks so much to both of you for running. Thanks for organizing this today. This is great. Thanks, Kate. Jill? Thank you. So like I said in the beginning, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about returning to Montpelier so I can continue the work to build a, an economy that leaves no one behind and to continue our COVID recovery that focuses on affordable housing and childcare, ensuring that we're doing everything we can to tackle climate change. And like you've heard tonight, it, you know, the constitutional amendments are really important and I hope we can count on your vote on those. That's the Reproductive Liberty Amendment and then the Prop 2 is the amendment to um, prohibit slavery and indentured servitude in our state. Uh, those are really critical. Uh, I don't think I can wrap up without just addressing some of the violence that we have been seeing in our community and how hard that has been. Um, we passed a law this year that closed the Charleston loophole uh, that expanded ex extreme risk protection orders and um, did a couple other things. But that work, we can't end. We have to keep on addressing gun violence in our state because what we're seeing in the Old North End is not okay. And, you know, I can't believe that I texted a friend and said, are you okay? And he said, no, that was me that was hit. It's, it's happening to our neighbors, and so we must take action. We have to take action at the city level, and we need to take action at the state level. So again, I'm Jill Kerwinski, and I hope I can count on your vote. Sep I almost said September, August, <laughs> August 9th. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you all. Thank you so much for running. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Water break. <laughs> I know. Great. We will transition to our state, uh, our Chittenden State Attorney um, debate. We have Sarah George, our incumbent, and ten, Ted Kenny, running um, for that Democratic uh, Democratic primary in August. So, if you two want to make your way up to the um, to the front, we'll just transition. Great, thank you both for making the time to join our meeting tonight. Um, we will follow the same format that we did for the previous forum. So we'll have two minute opening statements and then we'll have questions from the audience and from Zoom that will each have two minute responses from both of you. Um, any questions before we start? No. Okay, great. Um, well, Sarah, why don't you start? All right, thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, my name is Sarah George. I'm the Chittenden County State's Attorney. I have been a prosecutor in the Chittenden County office um, straight out of law school since January 2011. I became the elected uh, state's attorney in 2017. So for the last five and a half years, um, I've been the elected. Um, at, at nearly 12 years as a prosecutor, I have prosecuted thousands and thousands of cases from disorderly conduct to domestic violence, uh, sexual violence, attempted murder, and murder. And I've seen a lot of things that work, and I've seen far more things that don't work. Um, it's very clear to me that our system, our legal system, does not provide the public safety that we have been told it provides for a very long time. And I've tried to use my discretion, my prosecutorial discretion, to um, make our system more just and fair for everybody in it. Um, our system is built um, on a foundation of racism and classism and um, policies that perpetuate um, the same. And I have implemented a racial justice policy, a truancy policy, a non-public safety stop policy, a cash bail policy, um, and others that look at data and evidence-based research to determine where we're at as a state and a county. Um, I can tell you we are not at a good place. We are second in the country for most disproportionate prison population compared to our race. In Burlington, we arrest, um, prosecute, and incarcerate black and brown folks at a far disparate rate to our population. And that trickles through our entire system from um, truancies and delinquencies, youthful offender up to um, criminal court. So I am running for re-election because we have a lot more work to do and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Ted? Hi, um, is this, can everybody hear me? 
Okay, thanks. Um, my name's Ted Kenny. Uh, I live in Williston. I'm a native of Chittenden County. I was raised in Richmond um, and uh, moved away from Chittenden County for four years so that I could get a law degree. It took me four years because I had to work full time and went, uh, went to school at night, put myself through night school. Um, I moved back to uh, Vermont uh, two weeks after I graduated. And I did that because I love Vermont and I wanted to live my life here. Uh, I moved back to my hometown of Richmond and started my own practice. I got a public defender contract, so I did a huge number of criminal defense cases for indigent people. I also got a juvenile defender contract, so I was uh, representing children and adults and guardians in abuse and neglect and delinquency cases, uh, both in Chittenden County and Franklin County. Um, the rest, I, I developed a, a successful private practice, um, and along the way, uh, lived a life, uh, got married, have two daughters, ages 19 and 17. Um, my uh, uh, time was spent, besides doing that, being on my school board in the town of Williston, being on the select board in the town of Williston. I'm the vice chair of the select board now in Williston. Um, in 2020, I had an opportunity to become a division chief in the attorney general's office for the human services division. And it, it was a welcome change and it was important work, so I did that. Um, I did that until uh, the beginning of this year. Um, I'm, I'm running for state's attorney because I think we have new challenges, and I would like to present uh, the possibility of new, uh, new approaches to meet those. Um, I think that the uh, crime in Chittenden County overall, but in Burlington particularly, uh, is, is higher now uh, than it was in important ways. Um, I think we need to address that, and uh, I also, one thing, I, my, my political background, I've never, never been terribly successful as a politician, uh, but I, I was the chair of the County Democratic Committee. I believe in uh, the things that that, that would, might indicate. Um, the racial issues are real, they have to be addressed, um, but we need to balance both things, public safety and racial and criminal justice reform. Great, thank you. Um, well, we will open it up for questions, and first we'll take any questions from the room. So, uh, go ahead. I'm going to ask your question. This is a question I saw emailed. So okay, great. So go ahead. Yeah, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So this is a little bit of a long preamble. This is my name is Jane Nodell. I live on Charles Street. On Wednesday morning this week, a search warrant was executed as a, at a residence on Russell Street, well known to the neighborhood as an active hub of illegal drug trafficking. An individual was arrested and charged with sales of fentanyl. This person was arraigned in Chittenden County Criminal Court. At the time of arrest, this person was on parole for criminal offenses of heroin possession, violation of conditions of release, cocaine sale, assault and robbery, and aiding in the commission of a felony. They also had an active arrest warrant for failing to appear in court after a previous investigation and arrest in August 2021, which also resulted in charges of sales of fentanyl. This person was arraigned in Chittenden County Criminal Court and is being released with a 24-hour curfew. I would like to add that many members of the Russell and Charles Street neighborhood and Palmer Park area have been actively monitoring this house because it has its activities have imposed a lot of cost on the neighborhood, and especially people with children are very concerned about the activity associated with this house. My question is this, is being released with a 24-hour curfew appropriate, given this person's numerous felony convictions, failure to appear on another pending fentanyl distribution charge, pending parole violation, and new felony fentanyl distribution charges? If yes, this is appropriate, can you explain why? And if no, you think it is not appropriate, what can and should have been done instead? Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, we'll start with Ted and then go to Sarah. Um, the difficulty with scenarios like that is there are a lot of facts that go into each case. Um, from what I've heard, uh, it sounds like if somebody has, has failed to appear for court already, uh, has serious felony uh, background, uh, is a pending charge of fentanyl distribution and then picks up another one, um, then at that point we're probably getting close to where there's going to be a risk to, risk to flight. 
Um, and so, you know, again, not knowing more, I would say probably along the lines of either a, um, an actual, and I, I'm, I'm in very much in favor of actually cash bail reform that's been done, and I want to say that. Uh, um, but there are times when it's necessary, and I think this might be one of those times or even the possibility of hold without bail. Um, the, the difficulty is that, you know, if, if, the, if the cases are true and the parole violation is a violation and somebody has been selling fentanyl in the neighborhood, they're charged, they don't show up for court, and then they, they sell fentanyl again, um, that, that does ultimately say that there might be a public safety risk that a 24-hour curfew is not going to cover. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Jane. Um, it, you know, every case is obviously different, and the particulars of this case um, are a little complicated, but I also would just point out that um, she was released on a lot of conditions. It wasn't just a 24-hour curfew. There was a lot of other conditions of release as well um, that we requested and the, the court did impose. I think it's also telling that she is on parole. Um, the Department of Corrections has full authority to have taken her into custody and held her as long as they wanted to. Um, a parole hearing would be set and they could have revoked her entire sentence and had her um, serve that. They didn't do that. Um, I'm not sure why. I was surprised to see that they hadn't done that. But in terms of whether or not it sounds like the question is whether she should be held, and so under our laws, it would either be it would either be cash bail or a parole violation. Um, a hold without bail is not an option because that is only legally allowed for um, violent offenses, and this neither, none of her charges were violent offenses, so a hold without bail would not be an option. Um, and cash bail, in my opinion, would not be appropriate because she is, she lives here, she has always lived here as far as I know, and cash bail is only for risk of flight. It is not for public safety risks. So um, even if I believed in cash bail, it would not, in my opinion, be legally um, applicable here. Thank you. Got it. That's good to know. Thank you. Hi, Ryan. Great. Uh, we'll take a question from Zoom. If anyone wants to raise their hand on Zoom, we'll uh, take one question. OK. No hands popping up. Any hands popping up? Any hands popping up in person? Yeah. One. Oh, great. Go ahead. Um, so I live in the old North End, and um, I've lived here for um, 11 years in the old North End. And um, I think we're in a crisis right now, and uh, as far as public safety goes, and I, I, I feel, I'm seeing that from a lot of my neighbors and a lot of people that live in our neighborhood. Um, and I just wonder, um, you know, I know, you know, there's an issue with police retaining and holding on to police and staffing there. And um, uh, I just don't see any kind of enforcement going on in the neighborhood personally. Um, and I feel like I, I, I worked with a fellow who was a, a Burlington police officer for eight years. It's, you know, obviously one um, opinion, but it sounds like there's a real, um, their um, morale is at a real low level and um, it's going to be hard moving forward to retain police. And I just wonder, I know your, your job is working with the police and keeping a rapport with them. And what are you, what are you going to do in the future to you know, make that a position that's going to be attractive to people who are looking to <laughs> relocate to Burlington? And because you know, they have to be supported. I mean, and. Um, and you know, I just I just want to know um, how how we're going to do that because I, I know it's a it's a complicated issue, but I feel like we're really at a kind of a tipping point here, and I feel a lot of people feel that way as well. So thank you. Great, thanks for the question. Uh, we'll go with Sarah first, and then Ted. Yeah, it is a great question, and I I think that a really important 
part of this conversation is that it's a sort of perfect storm of a lot of bad things happening right now. Um, we have all of our police departments are understaffed in Chittenden County. All of our police departments statewide, including the Vermont State Police, are understaffed. Um, all of our prosecutor's offices are understaffed. We've lost several people during... Keep talking. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Yep. yep. Can you hear us now, Chris? Chris, can you let us know if you can hear us? Barbara, can you hear us? Barbara, can you hear us? Chris, can you hear us? Chris, can you hear us? Yep, there we go. I can hear you. Great. We oh. Chris, you can hear me can talking? Hear me? Okay, great. Thanks for letting us know. We <laughs> paused to fix that issue, so we'll let Sarah continue. Thank you. Um, um, during COVID, our office has lost, and, and many offices around the state have lost several employees um, to much less stressful jobs for a lot more money um, because we are facing a crisis right now, and you're, you're right. It is a crisis. We have, um, a, we have a before COVID had 32 chronically homeless people in Burlington, which I'm sure was undercounted, and it's now 160. Um, and as Ryan said, you know, health, housing is healthcare, housing is safety. Um, if we don't start meeting a lot more people's basic needs in this community, it's not gonna get better. And charging those people with low level misdemeanor offenses isn't gonna fix that. Um, but that being said, we are doing that. And I think there is a misconception in the community that we aren't. And I know some of that is because police are telling people in our community that we're not. Um, and I've had to do a lot of work on this campaign just to tell people the truth, um, which is really unfortunate. But it is happening. And you know, right now we have 421 retail theft cases pending in our court that aren't even getting set because we are so far behind. COVID has put us in such a difficult position and we're just trying to focus on the cases that have the domestic violence cases that have gone up and other cases that have gone up that we want to make sure that victims are being heard as soon as possible in our court. And that has meant that other cases are taking a back seat. It has meant that we are relying on and hoping that our restorative justice programs will take on more. Um, it is hopefully a short term issue. Uh, the, something that we can ultimately get ahead of, but right now we are not in that situation and we really have to focus on meeting people's basic needs. Great, thanks. Ted? Hey, thanks. Um, <clears throat> the uh, interaction between the state's attorney's office and law enforcement is one of the most critically important uh, uh, relationships in, in the uh, system. Um, so my focus would be on creating a, a very collaborative relationship going back and forth. The way I would describe it, if it works, is a uh, is constructive friction or creative tension, perhaps, uh, because the state's attorney can't be the uh, police officer's lawyer and vice versa, the, the police can't do what the, the state's attorney can't order the police around. Um, I will say in, in Williston, actually, we don't have, uh, we're not uh, short of police officers. We actually did a good job of keeping uh, them retained with bonuses when things were getting really rough. Um, but the, the bottom line is that the, uh, the, the relationship is, is very important. And one thing I've learned from you know, my various roles in charities and in the attorney general's office and uh, uh, on, you know, in my municipality is that when a, you you got to when when a, a group of people is is not um, coming to you, um, you got to go to them. Uh, if that's what's happening, then um, you know that's that's what I would do is go to them, not not to give away things or make uh, uh, agree to do things that I don't think are right, but just to go and make sure that they are listened to. 
um, and that they, they feel that they've been listened to. Um, so it's, I think the communication is, is critically important. Great, thank you. Um, any questions on Zoom at this point? Not seeing any hands, any questions in the room? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name is Rachel Jolly. I live in Ward 3. Um, my question has to do around the intersection of mental health and criminality. Um, I work at the Community Justice Center. We're seeing a huge rise in cases where mental health was an absolute factor in, at play when the crime was committed. So I'm curious about what you think this office um, can or can't do around that intersection and or other ideas for investments around this area, you know, around that, that intersection. Okay, we'll start off with Ted and then Sarah. Great, thanks. Um, that, that's an issue that's very dear to me uh, as well. Um, uh, going backwards in time, as the division chief in the Human Services Division for the AG's office, one of the departments that uh, the lawyers that I supervised represented was the Department of Mental Health. And um, you know, I had access to any number of cases where they would say, yes, the person has a mental health issue, but that is not the cause of their criminality. Um, I, I always was a little bothered by that because it seemed like it was a way to stiff arm because we just don't have the resources. Um, going further than that, uh, I'm the last of eight kids and we had significant mental health issues in my family. My first and third oldest brother were paranoid schizophrenic. Uh, my oldest brother became homeless and, uh, and died in Central Park in New York City. He was murdered when I was in college. Um, I've always assumed the per they never found out who did it. I always assumed the person who did it was mentally ill. Um, and I've always uh, remembered that and done my best to forgive that person, um, whoever he or she is. Um, we don't really have a mental health delivery system in the state of Vermont right now, in my opinion. Um, we shut down the state hospital. I used to visit my brothers at the state hospital when I was a kid. Um, I could tell stories that I find to be funny, but other people find probably are, are disturbing. Um, but uh, it, when that hospital closed down, we were supposed to go to a community health, a community based mental health system. And it seems like we didn't really do that. All we did is save the money. So the problem is the state's attorney's office does not have any direct control over that or housing or, or feeding people or any of that stuff. But what I would do is advocate as strongly as I possibly humanly could to the legislature, to people who have the, the reins of power, who have the levers that they could actually pull to, to recreate a system so we don't have people staying in the emergency room at the UVM Medical Center for three or four or five or seven or ten days or more because there's no bed available for them and, and the, the havoc is going to be sent back to the community and because of a mental health issue that hasn't been addressed. Thanks. Sarah? Yeah, it's a... Our mental health system in Vermont is um, incredibly inadequate. I have not been quiet about that. I've made decisions on cases um, in hopes of putting a lot more pressure on the Department of Mental Health and our mental health systems. Um, and every time it seems like it is met with um, a lot of resistance and because it costs money. And instead of cost spending the money to invest in more mental health services, um, like always, we expect that prosecutors are going to fix this problem, that police and prosecutors are going to fix it, and, and it absolutely does not work. I think that one of the best things that we have in Chittenden County now that I try to lift up and use as much as possible is our pretrial service um, organizations and our, and our pretrial monitors to try to connect people with those services while their cases are pending. We've seen really incredible success with that, but there are so many limitations given the staffing and resource issues within our community partner organizations. Um, we, as I said, rely a lot on our restorative justice programs, but there are some people whose needs are too much for them and we need an additional step. Um, when, we, when we do charge those people because it's not appropriate for restorative justice or they're unable to do it, we do try to connect them with a pretrial monitor so that they can engage, try to engage them in services while their cases are pending so hopefully they don't continue to pick up more charges. Um, but again, this idea that people with significant mental health issues 
that are picking up offenses are somehow going to be fixed by arresting them and putting them in jail um, without addressing the underlying mental health needs while the cases are pending um, is a flawed system. And we need to do a much better job at meeting those needs in the community um, quickly and whenever we can. Thanks. I think we have time for one more question. So let's check in one more time on Zoom. If anyone has a question on Zoom, please raise your hand. Does anyone, oh, we have a question from Megan. We'll give Megan the last, uh, last question. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering how the two of you differ, like what things you might not agree on. Thanks. Thanks, Megan. Uh, we'll start off with Sarah. Um, I mean, I, I worked with Ted for years. Um, as a deputy state's attorney, um, great respect for Ted as an attorney. I, I don't, I think the major ways that we differ are that he uh, disagrees with some of my policies. Um, he seems to agree with a lot of the stuff I'm doing, but maybe not the way that I'm doing it. I don't back down um, when people push back on some of the policies that I've done as a woman in this job, I face incredible pushback that my predecessor never did. And so I don't come out with policies unless I know that they are data driven and evidence based. And sometimes people don't like to hear the numbers. Um, it's the racial disparities and the realities of how our legal system actually plays out are sometimes hard for people to hear. Um, but the people that are most vulnerable and are consistently oppressed by it know very well. And, um, you know, I, I, I tend to think about them and how long they've been oppressed by the system and try to come up with situations that will make our system more fair and equal. Um, that's, that's, I think, the biggest difference as it appears to me, but I, I don't know any, I don't know. That's, that's what I would say. Thank you. Ted? Yeah, um, well, actually, I'd, I'd say the same thing. Um, Sarah is a good person, and uh, there's nothing personal about any of this at all. It is policy. Um, specifically, a couple of policies uh, that I would list. Um, the, the not prosecuting cases as a, a presumption, it could be overcome, but a presumption to not prosecute cases for non-public safety motor vehicle violations. In other words, blinker, um, defective equipment, depending. Um, things like that. If a, if a law officer pulls somebody over for that and they discover evidence of a crime, certain kinds of crime, like uh, non-specific uh, victim type crime, then the presumption is that they won't prosecute. And the reason for that is because of the racial disparities in when people are being pulled over. I agree the racial disparities are there. Um, I agree it is a horrific, terrible issue uh, that has to be addressed, has to be addressed with great focus. Um, but I don't agree with the policy for a couple of reasons. I don't, I don't agree that uh, people who don't use their blinker shouldn't be pulled over. I, I don't like it when people, when cops pull me over for that. Um, but I'm glad ultimately that they do it because we need to have safe roads. Um, the other thing is there was a, a about 40% of Vermont State Police DUIs are happened when they pull somebody over when there was no indicia that the person was drunk. In other words, they weren't weaving, they weren't acting like a drunk driver. Uh, so this kind of thing. Um, that's 40% of the drunk drivers that, you know, with, with the evidence, the best numbers that we have anyway, 40% of those of drunk drivers are going to remain on the road. Um, I, I, I don't want that. Um, I used to do a huge amount of DUI defense, and I know that people who are, almost everybody who's a DUI person is not evil. How much time am I out? Five seconds. Five seconds? <laughs> okay. All right. And... Anyway, but that, uh, that and um, conditions of release and things, there are a bunch of others too. So, uh, but that, uh, there, there's nothing personal in this. Um, I, I just think there's a difference in policy. Great, thank you. Um, we'll move on. We'll move on. I, if you could hold it, Chris, and send it to the candidates themselves, we um, need to wrap up and move to closing statements. So um, thanks, Chris. Um, so 
Ted, if you want to start, we have two minutes for closing statements. Sure. I, I don't think I'm going to take a full two minutes. Um, so th thank you all for coming uh, to this. Um, I know it's probably not everybody's first choice to be spending time doing this when the evening is good and it's, uh, we don't have many summer months in Vermont. Um, I, I am running for state's attorney because I do want to bring a, a different, uh, a different set of ideas and a different focus to the office. Um, again, there's nothing personal about this, but it is a uh, difference in, in policy opinion. Um, I would like to uh, just say in a, in a positive way, um, my experience as an attorney, my experience as a criminal defense attorney, as a juvenile attorney, my experience running my own practice, my experience managing 30 people in the attorney general's office, um, and my experience in leadership, I was the president of the Vermont Dismiss House, which is a house that houses people just out of prison. Um, it's a wonderful program. I was, uh, used to cook there with, with my kids. Uh, Got to get back to doing that when this is over. Um, my, my involvement with, the, with charities like that and my involvement with public service have, have shown me basically that um, when we are confronted with new issues, we should come up with new solutions. And uh, when we are doing that, that you basically have to wear a path in the carpet to people's door to make sure that they feel like they're part of the process, even if, even if their view is not ultimately accepted or uh, it's modified in some way. Um, people need to feel like they've, they've been heard. Um, I cannot promise that things are going to get easier if I am elected state's attorney. In fact, I think that we're going to have a hard time for the next 10 years at least in this country and in our community. Um, and the prosecutor's office is going to be no, uh, not going to be exempt from that. Um, but I do want to uh, use every degree of mind and spirit that I possess to bring a sense of public safety and racial and economic uh, reform to the system. Um, my Ted, tedforstatesattorney.com, there's a Wix thing. You can put questions in there for more stuff. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Sarah? Thank you. And thank you for putting this on. Thanks for having us. Um, I am running for re-election because I believe there's a lot more work to do. Um, I, I am doing this work every day. I am really passionate about this work. I love my job, even though it is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I have a staff that I trust that loves their that loves this work and I'm lucky that they love this work because it is very very hard. And they are lawyers with 200 plus thousand dollars in student loan debt that are making very little money to do it, but they're working tirelessly to try to fix a broken system and to make people in our community safe, um, not just a sense of safety, but actually to make people safer. And I think that that is really hard. When you are trying to dismantle a system that was put in place 200 years ago for very specific purposes, you are always going to hit bumps and there's going to be significant pushback. I collaborate every day with law enforcement. I collaborate every day with local community partners that are doing really good work to try to house people, to try to meet people's basic needs. They are where my focus is a lot of the time. Um, and I am also prosecuting cases. I have a full caseload. I am prosecuting the domestic violence and homicide cases in our community. I know how bad it can be. I know how much some people are suffering. But you, most of the community, we have about 10 to 15,000 cases a year. Most of the community hears about the bad. Um, we have thousands and thousands and thousands that go really well and that people actually come out of a system of harm feeling like they have been healed. And I focus on those, um, even though the media does not. And I would encourage people to, if you hear something in the community that my office is or isn't doing, please reach out directly and ask me. Um, my email is sarah.george at vermont.gov for work-related questions. And my campaign email is sarah for state's attorney at gmail.com. Thank you. Great. Thank you both. Thank you so much for running. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to join our meeting. Yes. We really appreciate it. Um, we will move on at this point to hear from our um, currently serving elected representatives from school boards, um, 
state house and senate and city council whoever is here so i see in the room we have a school board member i see on zoom we have a representative um oh great jill you're still here um <laughs> Great, so looks like we'll get reports today from our um, house representatives and from our school board. So why don't we go ahead and hear from our house representatives and we have on Zoom, um, Emma Mulvaney Stanek. Um, do you wanna give, uh, let's see, so we have 15 minutes left. So we'll give uh, seven minutes to uh, the house and seven minutes to school board. So Emma, do you wanna speak for about three minutes? No problem. Yes. And is it just Jill there? Because I want to make sure because there's a lot of us in the Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. I have family visiting. So I appreciate being able to jump in. I uh, hope everyone is doing well. I'm uh, Representative Emma Mulvaney Stanek. I represent what, what is now called Chinon 17, which is uh, west of Park Street over to the lake and from Battery Park all the way up to Letty and Ethan Allen Park roughly. So that is a one, the one remaining one seat district in Burlington after we redistricted. Uh, and I'm just going to give a bit of a policy update, uh, three things um, that I want to make sure folks are aware of, uh, just with my state rep hat on, um, although I am running for re-election, this is not a campaign okay. thing at all. So uh, from a state rep uh, perspective, I want to make sure folks know about a gun policy event I'm hosting on Zoom next Thursday, so a week from today, from 7.30 to 8.30 with Gun Sense Vermont, and also with the Vermont Chapter of Moms Demand Action, and also a national organization called Vote Mama Foundation. And we're going to explore um, what Vermont's policy is now, but also what these advocacy organizations really are recommending that Vermont do to really take uh, gun policy more seriously and move us forward, um, at least from my perspective, in ways that actually center community safety uh, and also understanding all the intersectionalities of gun policy, how it infects, affects um, mental health and suicide rates and the easy access to guns and what we need to do here. So all are invited. It is on Zoom again. So it, hopefully that's accessible for folks, 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. July 21st. Um, I'll put out on, on the Front Porch Forum and the Old North End Facebook group again, the registration link, because we do want to keep it a safe event. So we do ask folks to register um, ahead of time. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, as folks might have, it's been happening a lot in the northern part of, of the Chittenden 17 district, but it's creeping into the Old North End. And this is a little bit of an overlap of um, sort of, I think, something all elected folks should be aware of and working on, and not just a city issue. But there's been an ongoing for months now a uh, sticker issue where there's been hateful uh, transphobic stickers appearing on all sorts of things up and down the bike path on street signs, etc. And sadly, the city has not been as responsive as many of us had would like. So a couple things I just want folks to know that um, some neighbors, at least in my neck of the woods of the old North End and new North End have been trying to really organize around bringing the city forward to really be proactive. Um, and not simply just say we don't have the resources and personnel to remove the stickers because harm is being done to our trans neighbors. And so uh, we're working with the city to do some restorative practice work with the CJC, but also some of us have done a GoFund uh, have done a GoFundMe campaign and have some trans positive love stickers. I'll just call them, and we're distributing them out to folks. Not I'm not promoting putting them on street signs. I'm promoting you putting them up in other places that is allowable so that folks can know in this community that we support all people, however folks identify, and that these hate messages need to be responded to. Having them up for so long has been really harmful. So if folks are interested about getting those stickers for free because they've been funded by, by folks who've um, um, already donated uh, or want more information on any of that, please feel free to reach out. The third and final quick thing is uh, one piece of policy um, that I'm hoping to advance and collaborate with other legislators about um, if I'm reelected again is to really start to think about beyond proposal five, which I assume the speaker will probably speak to as well on the, the general um, election ballot, which is the constitutional amendment to uh, put into our constitution reproductive uh, rights, uh, is to think a little bit more broadly about what else Vermont can be doing now that Roe v. Wade has been um, thrown out by the Supreme Court. And specifically, there's a piece around pregnancy crisis clinics in the state or crisis pregnancy clinics that I forget which order the, the terminology goes. Uh, but a, a fellow representative, George Till, had introduced a bill last session and probably has done it multiple times before around the consumer protection piece around 
creating some transparency of what these clinics are. They're very predatory. They're not licensed medical facilities, and yet they really prey on low income and vulnerable parts of our population who need uh, contraception or are pregnant and needing um, counsel. And yet these are really fronts for anti-abortion um, national and global global um, uh, organizations. And so they do exist in Vermont. It's something I think we can really examine around consumer protection angle, as well as really understanding um, uh, or really requiring them to be transparent about who they are, what their real motives are, and stop the misinformation that they often put out. Now they've gotten much more sophisticated and there's a digital component that they often do putting up um, ads and other ways to click when people are Googling, as you might imagine being very stressed, trying to figure out options, these often pop up and they've been getting more sophisticated on um, trying to intercept, if you will, people who are seeking counsel on pregnancy and options around abortion or again, contraception. So that's something I'm looking into. If that's something of interest to you, I'm happy to hear your thoughts. A constituent reached out about this as well as some other folks. And again, I'm looking to collaborate with other legislators, but the simple point is there's more we can do here in Vermont and around the issues of reproductive justice. And the final thing I'll just say is beyond these um, crisis pregnancy centers, I think there's an economic justice angle of making sure that every Vermonter can afford and perhaps even, I hope, gain free access to um, abortion services or contraception. I'd love us to really create a state investment. So rather than um, sort of celebrating the fact that we have it codified in statute now, I would like us to take a step forward to really make sure that economics are never a reason that someone um, is faced with a um, unwanted pregnancy or a dangerous pregnancy, et cetera. So that's Great. it for me. I'll pass the mic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jill, would you like, we have about three minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, Jill Krowinski, I represent the Old North End in downtown Burlington and um, Kurt McCormick is the other state rep until January. Um, I have been focused on looking at the Supreme Court cases that have come down and how they impact us in Vermont. And Emma's mentioned um, one, I'll go through the list that I just really think are, um, tackling issues uh, and topics that we care deeply about and really need to understand how it impacts us in Vermont. So the first one is um, the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade. Um, Emma mentioned crisis pregnancy centers. We are looking at uh, not only the uh, with our legislative council, what the Supreme Court decision says, but also what the impact is from the executive orders from the Biden administration, looking at those two and saying what issues are left that we have we have not. Are there, are there any gaps and do we need to address those? So we are doing all of our research uh, this summer and fall to make sure that if there are gaps, that we introduce something day one in the legislative session to make sure that everyone is safe and protected and has access to high quality abortion care. Uh, the second one is gun violence prevention. There was a Supreme Court case that put some guardrails around what states can do regarding uh, gun violence prevention. And so uh, we are doing work uh, with legislative counsel over the summer and fall to figure out um, how that impacts us and what we are still able to pass in our state. Uh, that is really uh, important for us to continue to work on and understand um, what, what we can still do. And lastly, there was a Supreme Court decision around what public education funds, um, how they can be used regarding religious schools. Uh, and I have some really serious concerns about that Supreme Court case and how it impacts us in Vermont. And so we are also doing that work over the summer and fall to figure out how that impacts us here uh, in Vermont. So right now, because we're in a we're in campaign season, uh, those of us who are um, still serving will do this work over the summer and fall to research bills and um, and then start working on what we're gonna introduce in January if we're reelected. So if there's an issue that you care about that you um, wanna talk to me about, don't hesitate to reach out. My number is 828-2245, 828-2245. Um, or you can email me. <laughs> yeah, right? It does have a little ring to it. Um, or you can contact me at speaker at ledge dot state dot vt dot us. I know our email addresses are ridiculously long and <laughs> need to figure out a way to make it a little shorter. So thank you. I really appreciate it. Don't hesitate to reach out.
if you have any questions after. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, we'll go ahead with Jen in the school board report. And I can't do anything concise like that. I do want to start. <laughs> we have about we have about six or seven minutes. So. That feels generous. And once again, <laughs> best for last. <laughs> Um, so I, good news for the first time in seven years, there is not a wait list for pre-K in the district. Mm -hmm. So there were some uh, two schools and every single school has a pre-K program. Caveat is two of those programs are half day and that is going to change at some point. I'm not sure why, but I wanted to start with good news. Speaking of child care and child care issues. Um, I'm mostly going to talk about the high school. There's some major updates coming down the pike on Monday, the 18th, the uh, superintendent chair and the director of finance will be presenting an update about what's going on with the BHS, uh, well, Burlington High School, Burlington Technical Center build um, at, at the city council meeting. And actually, I think they're doing a presentation before that at the five o'clock finance, mm -hmm. city finance committee meeting. <clears throat> um, it's hard to know where people are at as far as new news. Just in case you do not know, the board did vote unanimously to remove the high bay technical center programming infrastructure, whatever part of the building from the, the design moving forward. We did that because Senator Leahy secured a $10 million grant or, well, people actually asked him for it and he granted it um, for an aviation program that's going to happen at the airport. And on in addition to that, Beta Technologies has in you know done a written statement or in good faith been meeting with district leaders about programming being expanded um, tech, tech center programming being expanded. All of those big bay type of um, industrial, uh, uh, I don't want to say programs again, because I already said it like five times, classes, <laughs> um, the, they, they're really expensive to house. And the idea of taking half of the tech center school community and having them closer to industry, closer to like, you know, lack of a better phrase, the action that they're actually interested in. So that is, that sounds kind of exciting in two different, in two ways. And one, the other way is that it would mean bonding for $20 million less than what we're working with at this point. And speaking of money, cause you know, that's one of the main topics that school board members have to worry about. Um, there have been a couple of new developments also in that there is a new entity called Burlington Students Foundation that you, not everybody can go and ask for donations. This particular thing has the right credentials to be able to take legally money on behalf of uh, fundraising for this project. And there are uh, state and federal opportunities that have been identified. I'm not sure. I know it's throughout July that the you know grant writing and everything from the angle of, oh, this is about tech education and this is about environmental protection, you know, because we're dealing with PCBs. There's many different avenues in which uh, they're looking into finding funding so that the burden does not fall all on the taxpayers. So the main, all of this work is going into uh, being able to get, obviously first uh, an af affordable, but I mean, that's actually kind of second to a really awesome school for the students. Second to that is affordably. And Roxanne, I'm, I'm going to go over, just going to let you know, but good job being a timekeeper. I know it's your first time. I, I know I waited all this time. Guess what, guys? It's your turn to wait. Um, yeah, so back to the project. Okay. At the, during the month of July, all of the more details about what the design entails as far as 
classrooms, everything, all that, the more nitty gritty or more detail. And then it goes to get the estimates, the cost estimates then come up. And that is where the district, the board has to approve an idea of what we're gonna ask taxpayers for in the form of a bond. That has to get approved then by the city council and it can't go on the ballot until then. But that has to, and we're talking about a November ballot, everything has to be decided by August 17th. So it's, it's kind of unfortunate because August, September, October, that's two and a half months to fundraise, but we're still gonna fundraise. We have to ask for what we know we need mm -hmm. and then continue to fundraise. Is there any questions? Where do we find more information about that? Oh, hey, that's a good question because who's taking notes tonight? Cause this is the kind of stuff where I usually send lots of links. Chris on who's on Zoom is taking notes. Awesome. Sounds so you good. can speak it and so they'll gonna be, so this presentation that's going to happen at city at city council. It's all going, going to be taped as well as the board meeting. Um, there's more than one presentation. The one for the board is a little bit more detailed than the one for city council. There's the district website. Um, this is being coined BHS BTC 2025. Great. Any other questions for any of our elected representatives? We have one or two minutes. Hi, Mila. Oh, great. Hi. Hi. My name is Mila Grant, live in Ward 3. Not as much of a question, as much as a statement, given, given what's happened recently, um, the violence in our community, and the things that have actually been happening for quite some time now. Um, there's been a lot of issues around guns, um, and there's a lot of issues around youth who are dropping out, maybe going through the Vermont Adult Learning Center to get their GEDs. And I just want to say that the high school has to be doing more to keep these students in school because it's in school and it's also through certain programs in the tech center that they stay involved with positive things. And also we need to make sure that they're being told and reminded of their value. That is not consistently happening. Now I had a kid go through the school system here I know how understaffed the school system is, especially with regards to the guidance counselors. But somehow we have to touch these students. And you know, I've had conversations with some of them. No one tells them they can't go to college or they can't learn a trade, but no one's telling them they can. Mm. So we are missing some really vital pieces. And we have some of these children who are going into young adults and they don't have the proper support and they don't have anyone counteracting these misguided thoughts about why they feel they need a weapon that they are now going out and using you know so if our local police don't understand well why some of these children are out at 2:30 in the morning that's a problem because we need to understand why they're out 2.30 in the morning. And it's kids of all races. But in particular, um, our BIPOC children are really, because of some of the issues that some of them have found themselves in, they're all getting profiled in a way that's not acceptable. Um, and our department is talking in a way that's, that's not acceptable and not solving the problem. So I really think the school has to do more. They have, yeah. somehow we gotta figure it out we have to do more to support these kids and keep them in school. We're letting too many of them just be like, yeah, I don't want to be bothered with that. I'll just get my GED. And so just wanted to say that. Thank you for yeah. the work that you do and your time. Um, do you mind if I invite you to some school boards, like just nonchalantly send you Zoom links? That would be lovely. Great. Great. 
Thank you, everyone. I think with oh, that- Can I briefly we'll... respond to Milo just really quickly? Okay, sure. sure. I, I, really, I promise really short, because I just want to really lift up the fact that um, Milo, who I know is a police commissioner, um, and her work and what she said right at the end there around the dangerous um, uh, dog whistling that is coming out of our acting um, ch police, chief of police and how dangerous that is, the way that he's messaging, as well as the media is picking up. It's also the media um, and really putting imagery and racial undertones, racist undertones to how messaging is happening. It's beyond problematic. It's really harmful. Um, and uh, uh, the Social Equity Caucus for the General Assembly um, and the White Affinity Group for that caucus has just put out an op-ed that will come out next week to really connect that it's not just Burlington that this is um, causing harm, it causes harm everywhere in the whole state. And we really have to get real on police bias and how, why that is harmful. So I just wanted to lift that up. And Milo, thank you for your service on the police commission and us as le elected leaders, especially white elected leaders have to step into that space much more. Great. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, everyone. I think with that, we'll adjourn. Thank you for sticking it out to the bitter end and uh, for coming out in July. It's nice to see everybody in person, and we will be back September 8th. So have a great night. <laughs>